A very warm welcome to the art vlog, art lovers. Today I want to take you inside one of the most intriguing big shows of the summer here at Tate Modern. It pairs the Dutch abstract great Piet Mondrian with the Swedish um, artist Hilma of Klimt. Now, um, these, uh, these artists do have some things in common. Obviously they were both pioneers of abstraction. They both died in 1944. And they both had an interest in spiritualism which informed their work. But as far as I'm aware, they never met, didn't work together, and didn't really influence each other. So I say it's intriguing because I'm really excited to see what Tate Modern are going to do to bring these two artists together. It should be said that Mondrian has obviously been recognised with a stellar reputation ever since his, um, his practice. Whereas Hemraf Klim kept her abstract words deliberately secret and died outside of her native Sweden, a relative unknown. So come and join me as I head inside and see what Tate Modern have managed to do to pair these two um, very different, aesthetically different artists together. <laughs> quickly that both Pierre Bondrian and Hilma of Klimt were, were, were both um, traditional artists as well as being radical experimenters. Mondrian was very much influenced by the Hague School in his native Holland in the early days, whereas Hilma of Klimt was often well known for her more traditional works within Sweden and it was these that she displayed um, publicly in her lifetime, unlike the more radical works which we're about to see as the exhibition progresses. In the Ruby Evolution, we see how the Mondrian and Mondrian moved away from more traditional works you've just seen. The paintings for the Temple series is one of um, Hilma of Klimt's most famous series of work. It comprised of 193 paintings in all, of which we see a sub-series here. And you see that Hilma of Klimt was trying to return to the unity and oneness which she saw existed in creation, and something that she'd been, that'd be replaced by duality which she resisted, man, woman, good, evil, light and dark. So this is an artistic attempt to return to that oneness. And we also see how she um, moved from recognisably um, figurative works in this series to more and more abstract works which began to dominate her later pieces. Um, interestingly, when Rudolf Steiner saw these works, he said he couldn't understand them and he thought it would be decades before anyone could understand them. Have a look and see if you can make anything of them as well as you, as you have a look at the wall which displays, as I say, an excerpt from many, many works in this series. Mondrian also, as you can see here, became influenced by, by post-impressionism. He was particularly um, influenced in his early years by Van Gogh and inspired by Van Gogh's bold, bold colours and brush strokes. And um, you can begin to see influences of post-impressionism in the works that we're presented with in this exhibition by Mondrian as he moves away from the more traditional landscapes you saw in Room 1. Both painters were interested in the belief system of theosophy and um, this painting, Evolution, represents the stages from the physical to the sp spiritual realm. both contrasts the differences in the sense of their different interests. Hilma of Klimt was interested in the um, flowers for native countries whereas Mondrian was interested in more cultivated flowers and he preferred if possible to paint single flowers so he could really explore their structure. Interestingly in Mondrian's case um, he was often successfully selling these, some of these beautiful pictures of flowers um, as well as producing abstract works, especially in the 1920s. And it was only really when his abstract works began to take off 
that he stopped having time, as he complained, to produ produce as, 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 as many flowers. And it's really interesting to see the fact that some of these are completed works, but some of them are also half-finished sketches as well, which suggests the transient nature of plants as they go through their own life cycles. Another theme that joins the artists together um, is their love for painting trees and we get to see how they approach these in very different ways to express their own artistic desires. For Hilma of Klint, it was, it was really about the mythological and, and, and religious um, symbolism of the tree, often like the world tree that connects every part of the universe. And what I really liked about these was that they were kind of like half of they, they 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 were half scientific and almost botanical but half much more mystical with with flourishes of the art nouveau as well as the as the exhibition points out For Mondrian, we see some expressionist style um, trees, including one of my favorite um, and most dramatic works in the exhibition. Um, this one, which is absolutely beautiful, the evening, the red tree. But we then also, as you're about to see, see how he moves away, influenced by cubism, to expressing trees in different ways. And we begin to see steps towards his full abstraction in these works. dynamic colour um, room, we see how both artists use colour to move towards their most famous styles. We see how, um, how uh, Mondrian kind of broke away from figurative art through to, to pure abstraction and how this led him to experiment with colours and, and as we find out further on in the exhibition, ultimately led him to just using primary colours. series we also see um, Hilma of Klin playing with colour using pastel colours although painting in oils to try and um, to try and break down this duality again this time between um, man and woman man and female often using blues and yellows um, to try and create harmony and oneness and maybe even challenge the exhibition um, speculates ideas of gender and it's probably one of the reasons why Hilma of Clint is such a well-loved artist by many modern art lovers because she's incredibly ahead of her time when thinking about gender fluidity in her work and, and breaking down this idea of man and woman. In 1920 in a sign of Hilma of Clint's um, ambition. She tried to create a work entitled Series 2, most commonly known as, as World Religions, where she attempted to visualise and express in the abstract language of these cement segmented circles which you can see here, different major religions of the world at various stages of their development. New old geometry section. It's really interesting for two main reasons. Um, it shows two series, including this one and the Swan series you're going to see later on. And it basically explores how Hilma of Kimps sort of shifted from the more organic, circular, sort of plant influenced, semi abstract work you've seen before to more geometrical shapes, harder shapes, blocks of colour, which you can kind of see here. And it also shows how she's moving from the figurative to the purely abstract in this Swan series. Um, big range of paintings here um, which show this.
been hoping for uh, Mondrian in his abstract pomp, then the room, space and rhythm is for you because this is where we see him develop his ideas of neoplasticism. The idea was to strip out all naturalism um, and inessentialness from painting and he wanted to really all representations of reality disappeared. This is a pure type of abstract art uniquely ordered. He was very interested in showing the relationships between colours and shape and it's interesting because some of the colours take on different importance. Some come forward, some come back. He's always interested in the relationship between colours. He begins to only work in the primary colours, as you can see here. And these works in the late 1920s began to get popular, especially in America. Um, he began to use the double line um, to, to explore this as well. This was a significant development in his work as well. I was really gutted they couldn't get Broadway Boogie Woogie from, the, um, from, from America. But, but still, there are some really wonderful Mondrians in this section, as you can hopefully see here. One of my favourite pieces of the show and the beating heart of the show was this, the Ether. Um, the Ether combines work by Hilmar F. Klimt and, um, and Piet Mondrian. And it's an absolutely fascinating room. It was probably the highlight of the exhibition for me. And you can actually enter it quite early on in the exhibition or towards the end. And there are notebooks, sketches, letters, um, smaller works, models, as you can see here. And I'll let you just have an explore in a second. But um, I was wondering when it would be best to see it. And I went in quite towards the end, having just come out of the neoplasticism that you've just seen. But I wish I'd probably got in it a bit earlier because it's a fantastic way of getting into the brains of the artists. So just have a look at it here. Clint had been working in pure abstraction since 1906 before her male um, counterparts like Kandinsky and for me the Parseval series which may be referencing a Wagner opera or one of the knights from the round table is is a stunning example of where she was by 1916 she's looking at gradations of color um, to to sort of develop a rhythm if you like there are cryptic symbols in these works this isn't so much about the individual works but about how they relate to each other and how you can begin to see and feel an artistic rhythm in the different colors that she she uses it's a real highlight of the show for me largest and most ambitious works that Hilma Avklin produced, the ten largest, which, which um, explore the journey from childhood through adulthood to old age and death. She was doing nothing more than trying to, um, trying to uh, portray, as she said, the journey of the soul throughout life. 
and these paintings in quite a dark gallery really overwhelm you. They're actually part of the paintings for the Temple series and they're a fitting end to an epic show. Wow, I mean, I think that was an epic show and I hope you enjoyed that walkthrough and selection of different, um, a, a different works by both Hilma of Klint and uh, Pierre Mondrian. Um, my first question, I suppose, is did this work as an exhibition? And unfortunately, the, the pairing of Klimt and Mondrian pro, posed difficulties because, yes, the um, influences were, were quite clear in terms of their reaction to nature or their interaction, sorry, with nature, the, um, the spirituality clearly, and the move from um, figurative work and landscapes to abstraction. But I just found they were so aesthetically different that bouncing from one to the other in the same room made it really hard to appreciate either and especially I would say Hilma of Klint who, whose voice is so distinctive that you kind of need to be immersed in her world. That's not to say that I don't recommend this show. As you hopefully saw, there are some wonderful works of art here um, from both Klimt and uh, Mondrian. I prefer aesthetically Mondrian's work, but lots of people I know would disagree with that. And as always, please post in the comments if you're a Klimt fan and you love her work. Um, the place where it all came together for me and coalesced was in this crazy, wonderful central room called the Ever. It's the hardest to bring you because it's full of notebooks and sketches and smaller pieces of work. But you really got the sense here of being in both of the artist's brain. Again, the interactions weren't, weren't key for me, but you, it was a really, really great room and it's right at the beating heart of the exhibition. And in fact, you can go in it quite near the start because it joins or, or near the end. Other highlights, obviously Mondrian in his pomp, um, and finally the, 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 the great large paintings in that final crimp room, some of her masterpieces which just are like a wow moment when you step in there. So I did enjoy the art, um, and I might well go back a couple of times, firstly um, to see the Mondrians and then to see uh, the Klimts and see if that works as a more pleasing experience. Yeah, one other thing I would say is, you know, when you're comparing artists who are quite different. You know, comparing this curation to the Soutin Kossoff show where it gave each artist a voice, I think would have been something that Tate could have done. And they did do that towards the end. There's a dedicated Klim room and then a dedicated Mondrian room. And that worked better for me. Although I do think these artists are such big figures in modern art that each of them could have quite easily packed a punch in a mega blockbuster. But I do still commend the Tate for trying to, um, to, to sort of almost make us rethink, especially Mondrian. He's often seen as very cool, abstract, straight lines, clinical primary colors. So by reintroducing him to the spiritualism, which is apparent in Klimt, you know, that did make me think about him in a different way. So I commend the, the, the Tate curators for, for trying to make us think about modern art in a different way. So I enjoyed it. The art itself was eight or nine out of 10. The, the linking between these two artists was a six out of 10 in terms of how the exhibition um, hung, to, hung together. But I do advise that you come along and see it because both of these are really, really interesting artists. The show's on until the 3rd of September. 20 pounds is good value for what you get. You get a lot of, um, of, of really great works. Lots have come from the Klimt Foundation or from uh, the Netherlands especially. Lots have been loaned. So that was a real special as well. Overall, yep, enjoyed it. It didn't hang together for me as an exhibition, but that doesn't matter when you're being surrounded by such great art. Do remember to subscribe to the art vlog, hit that notification bell, and um, most importantly, get out there and keep exploring the wonderfully rich UK art scene.